Hello, Newark Baptist Church, and welcome to our weekly Bible study. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we ask, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would guide and direct us into all truth tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So, we are now in lesson number 144 in our series called Understanding the Jews. And tonight's lesson is entitled, David and Absalom, Part 2. So over the last few months, uh, we've been jumping around in the scriptures a little bit uh, so we could follow David's relationships with various important people in his life. And last week, uh, we returned to the book of 2 Samuel to pick up the beginnings of David's interactions with another person who was important to him, his son, Absalom. And we saw that Absalom was the result of what was called an ill-advised marriage uh, with a non-Jewish Aramean woman named Maaka. And tonight, we're going to get into the first recorded account of the only son that resulted from that marriage, or at least the first incident involving that only son. So we're going to go now to the time period after the tragic events of David's murder of Uriah the Hittite, uh, the subsequent death of his first son that he had with his sinful affair, or as a result of his sinful affair with Bathsheba, and then the birth of his second child, Solomon. So wrapped up in all of that, uh, and subsequent to that, was David's leading the army to a great victory over the Ammonites. And I'm sure that David was hoping that that military victory uh, would restore some good feelings and change the atmosphere in the palace in a positive way. But it wasn't long before Nathan's prophecy of pending family dysfunction in David's household was going to make itself known. It was just going to be a part of the price that David would pay for the innocent blood that he had shed to cover up his sin with Bathsheba. And what we're about to go over was going to be a pretty terrible down payment on the debt that he owed. And we find this account in 2 Samuel chapter 13, an incident that would begin to tear the family apart. So let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 13 and the very first verse, 2 Samuel 13, 1. Scripture reads, and it came to pass after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar. And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. So right away we see or we are introduced to the main characters. First, we have Absalom and Tamar. And these two were the only children that David had with his non-Jewish wife, Maaka. And not surprising, we're going to find out that being the only two children from that marriage, they were very close. One brother, one sister. Then we have Amnon. Amnon was David's firstborn. To his second wife, Ahinoam. Remembering that David's first wife, Michael, didn't have any children. That means that Amnon was at that time the first and eldest offspring among all of David's sons. So these are the central figures that will be involved in the events that are going to unfold. But there is something that should not get lost before we get into this. We previously talked at length 
about the many sons of David. And he had many. And I showed you a chart that revealed that he had more than 19. Question. How many daughters did David have? Well, the Bible names only one. Tamar. One daughter among all those sons. Do you think that Tamar's brother Absalom would have been protective of her? Well, as we get into this account, we're going to see that the answer to that question becomes quite clear. And there's one last thing to consider before we get started. And for that, I want to take us forward to the time of Christ. Do you remember what the primary reason was behind the hatred that the Jews had for the Samaritans? Was it not because the Samaritans had intermarried with Gentiles, non-Jews? That made them half-breeds in the eyes of Israel. And accordingly, they became subjects of much contempt. Question, what were Absalom and Tamar? Yes, they too were of a mixed race. Their father was a Jew. But their mother was a Maacathite, an Aramean, a non-Jew. Another question. Do you think that particular subject ever came up? It's not hard to picture a family scene where there would have been a dispute, an argument between the sons of David. And on those occasions, do you think that would have been something that would have been thrown in their face? We know the answer. Of course it was. People are people. When the blood starts to run hot, those are the kinds of things that will come out. We all know it. And most of us, if not all of us, have experienced it. We've seen it. What will cut the most? That would have been another reason why Absalom and Tamar would have been close. It was the old us-against-the-world mentality. I have your back. You have mine. So that's the backdrop for what is going to follow. And I want to get into that on the next verse, or in the next verse, 2 Samuel 13 and verse number 2. Scripture reads, And Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin. And Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. One thing that's pretty universal about ancient kings, they knew what they liked. Being king allowed them to pretty much have their pick of any woman in the kingdom to whom they were attracted. They could choose whomsoever it was that attracted them the most. That being the case, you would be hard-pressed to find the wife of any king or any wife of a king who was not the fairest of the fair. They were singled out for a reason. And that circumstance would surely have applied to King David's father-in-law, the king of Geshur. 
his wife was almost assuredly a woman of great beauty. And her daughter, Maaka, the one whom David married, well, she seems to have been in that same category. And consistent with the fact that Maaka's daughter Tamar caused Amnon to pine for her so much <clears throat> that he made himself physically ill, can only prove to us what she must have looked like. In fact, as we get a little farther into the scriptures, we're going to find out that even Tamar's brother, Absalom, will also be described as having stunning good looks. It ran in the family. So, we've just read verse 2. And in that verse, we saw that Amnon was physically attracted to Tamar. So much so, that he couldn't think about anything else. He was obsessed. But Amnon had a problem. He knows that he really has no right to act on his feelings. To do so would not only be immoral, it would be a clear violation of Jewish law. He couldn't have relations with Tamar outside of marriage because, well, that would be fornication. And he couldn't marry her either because it was not permitted for a half-brother to marry a half-sister. For that will go to the law, Leviticus 18.9. Scripture reads, The nakedness of thy sister, the daughter of thy father, or daughter of thy mother, whether she be born at home or born abroad, even their nakedness thou shalt not uncover. So Amnon knew these facts all too well. But we all know the lore of forbidden fruit. And that's what Tamar was, forbidden fruit. So Amnon was frustrated and he became depressed. He began to pine over Tamar in such a way that his distress became apparent to those who were in his company. Let's continue on. 2 Samuel 13 and verse 3. Scripture reads, But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother. And Jonadab was a very subtle man. Amnon had this friend named Jonadab, who also happened to be his cousin. We're told that Jonadab was a very subtle man. That may have been a good thing, could have been a good thing, because Amnon was definitely in need of some wise counsel. But, the word in our Bibles that appears here as subtle is from the Hebrew kakam, C-H-A-K-A-M, it's pronounced kakam. And it can describe true wisdom or evil craftiness. And while Amnon counted Jonadab as a friend, the advice that he got was pure evil. In fact, following Jonadab's advice was going to result in Amnon's complete ruin. With friends like that, you don't need enemies. The interaction between these two men is a warning to us. Be careful about what type of people you are surrounding yourself with. So let's see how this so-called friend 
gets involved in Amnon's situation. 2 Samuel 13, 4. And he, this is his friend Jonadad now, and he said unto him, Why art thou, being the king's son, lean from day to day? Wilt thou not tell me? And Amnon said unto him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. So it looks like Jonadab couldn't help noticing that Amnon was moping around, being miserable. So he says, why have you been acting so, the Bible says, lean, day after day, lean being interpreted as low. What's making you feel so low? And Jonadab added something in his question that was going to give Amnon the justification that he was looking for. Jonadab prefaces his inquiry with a reminder to Amnon that he was the king's son. And by what follows, we can determine that Jonadab was inferring that being the king's son, it was within his right and within his power to satisfy whatever desire it was that he was dealing with. Of course, we've already discussed the prohibitions against Amnon acting on his feelings towards Tamar. But, by Jonadab's forthcoming counsel, we're going to see that he obviously made the case that being the king's son, he could surely be accepted from the rules that ordinary men would have to follow. Essentially telling Amnon that he was above the law. But during that original conversation, we saw that Amnon spilled the beans. He tells Jonadab that he's lovesick for his half-sister Tamar. And here's where Jonadab goes wrong. Instead of helping his cousin to resist, what is surely an evil temptation, which is what a true friend would have done. Jonadab uses his craftiness to show Amnon how he can ignore what was right and get what he wants. Very simple to Jonadab. Tells Amnon, you want it? You're the king's son. You should have it. So next, we have this charade of a plan that's actually going to use Amnon's father, King David, to unknowingly act as a facilitator in this plan. Go to 2 Samuel 13.5. Jonadab said unto him, Lay thee down on thy bed and make thyself sick. And when thy father cometh to see thee, say unto him, I pray thee, let my sister Tamar come, and give me meat, and dress the meat in my sight, that I may see it, and eat it at her hand. Jonadab tells Amnon to get into bed, and make himself sick. Now we've already seen that Amnon had been moping around acting sick for days. So the idea now is for him to act like he's getting sicker to the point where he now has to resort to his bed. Of course, that would prompt his father David to come and check on him. Thus, giving him the opportunity to ask for a favor. Of course, that favor was to have David instruct Tamar 
to tend to her supposedly sick brother. Oh, that was surely devious, but it was a crafty twist. The Moor may have been suspicious if the request to come to Amnon had come from Amnon. But since it came from her father, well, her guard would have been down. So now we're going to see how this unfolded. Second Samuel, we're going to read a passage in verse or in chapter 13 from verse 6 down through 12. Scripture reads, <clears throat> So Amnon lay down and made himself sick. And when the king was come to see him, Amnon said unto the king, I pray thee, let Tamar my sister come, and make me a couple of cakes in my sight, that I may eat at her hand. Then David sent home to Tamar, saying, Go now to thy brother Amnon's house, and dress him meat. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house, and he was laid down. And she took flour, and kneaded it, and made cakes in his sight, and did bake the cakes. And she took a pan, and poured them out before him. But he refused to eat. And Amnon said, Have out all men from me. And they went out, every man, from him. And Amnon said unto Tamar, Bring the meat into the chamber, that I may eat of thine hand. And Tamar took the cakes which she had made, and brought them into the chamber to Amnon her brother. And when she had brought them unto him to eat, he took hold of her, and said unto her, Come, lie with me, my sister. And she answered him, Nay, my brother, do not force me, for no such thing ought to be done in Israel. Do not thou this folly. So, it looked like things were going according to plan up until this point. Amnon had set the stage. He had removed everyone from the room so that he and Tamar were now alone. And so he asked her to lie with him hoping that she would be agreeable. But she wasn't. And unlike Jonadab, Tamar then gave Amnon some good advice. He told him <clears throat> that the only way that this was going to happen was if Amnon forced her against her will, something she said was not acceptable and was not to be done in all of Israel. It would be folly. Folly here is the Hebrew nevala, and it's interpreted as a profane disgrace. Seeing that Amnon still was determined to have his way, he made an appeal to his understanding of what the consequences of such an act would be. Let's look at it. 2 Samuel, just a half a verse here, 13, 13a. <clears throat> Scripture reads, And I, whither shall I cause my shame to go? And as for thee, thou shalt be as one of the fools in Israel. <clears throat> so, she tells Amnon that <clears throat> she herself would be a marked woman and would have to bear everlasting shame. How could she ever get rid of it? And as for him, he would be seen as a fool. Essentially saying to Amnon, if you don't think about the consequences to me, at least think about the consequences to yourself. And then she begins to grab at straws. 
For that, we'll look at the second half of that verse. 2 Samuel 13, 13b. <clears throat> Scripture reads, Now therefore I pray thee, speak unto the king, for he will not withhold me from thee. Looks like this is an attempt by Tamar to buy herself some time. She suggests to Amnon that he can avoid all of this mess and public shame if he would just ask the king to give her to him in marriage. Surely the king would not deny his own son's request. Now surely Tamar must have known what the law said concerning the marriage of two close relatives. And it's evident by what she's already said to Amnon about the disgrace that his actions would involve. But she was desperate. Desperate to get out of that situation. And perhaps Amnon would at least entertain the idea. Give it some further thought before it was too late. But Amnon had stopped listening. Let's go to the scripture, 2 Samuel 13, verses 14 and 15. <clears throat> Albeit, <clears throat> or nonetheless, he would not hearken unto her voice, but being stronger than she, forced her and lay with her. Then Amnon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred wherewith he hated her was greater than the love wherewith he had loved her. And Amnon said unto her, Arise, be gone. So there would be no need for the scriptures to mention the fact that Amnon was stronger than Tamar unless Tamar was trying to resist. He was simply overpowered by Amnon. This was not consensual. This was a sexual assault. And in the aftermath, it is recorded that Amnon hated Tamar with more intensity than he had loved her before. Question, did Amnon ever love Tamar? Absolutely not. At least not with a true love. What Amnon did have was lust. He most definitely lusted after her. But lust is not love, not true love. True love, godly love, seeks the best interest of its object. Lust, on the other hand, is all about gratification of one's self. So Amnon has satisfied his desire. He had been with Tamar. But his overtures were not reciprocal. Tamar did not love him back. And not only did she not return his misplaced passion, she had called him out as being a fool. So the result of this liaison was now turned on his head. Anmon's initial lust is turned into total revulsion and contempt. There is in our culture, our present culture, and it has been over the centuries, a whole body of literature devoted to this very subject. It's called unrequited love. And as we have already noted, the word love here that we're talking about is not true love. It's a selfish love. And selfish people 
who direct that kind of love toward another person do not take rejection very well. And David's son, Amnon, fulfills that description to the letter. We find that Amnon wants Tamar gone. Get out of my house. Get out of my sight. So now it is Tamar who has a change of heart. Reluctant, maybe, but a change nonetheless. Her great desire to escape has now been replaced with a desire to stay. She seeks to appeal to Amnon's sense of reason and compassion. She knows that in that society, a woman in her situation would be considered damaged goods, unsuitable for marriage. And as much as she may have disliked Amnon, staying with him was now preferable to being discarded. Let's look at 2 Samuel 13, 16. Scripture says, And she said unto him, There is no cause. This evil in sending me away is greater than the other that thou didst unto me. But he would not hearken unto her. So Tamar says that what Amnon had done to her was a bad thing. But now the deed was done. Could not be undone. And to now release her back into Jewish culture as a marked woman was going to make things much worse. But her plea fell on deaf ears. Back to the scriptures. 2 Samuel 13, 17. Scripture reads, Then he called his servant that ministered unto him and said, Put now this woman out from me and bolt the door after her. Gotta love Amnon. As they say down south, bless his heart. It was Amnon who orchestrated this whole mess. He was the one who set it all up. He was the one who had deceived Tamar and used her care for her brother as part of his trap to force her to submit to his own will. But now, he's giving the order to throw her out, and get this, to bolt the door behind her. And I was trying to create the impression well, that it wasn't him, but Tamar, who was the aggressor. She was the one <clears throat> trying to force her way into his quarters. To the point that he had to bolt the door to keep her out. That's precious. So now, Tamar has been defiled defamed, and discarded. 2 Samuel 13, 18 and 19, the scripture reads, And she had a garment of diverse colors <clears throat> upon her, for with such robes were the king's daughters that were virgins apparelled. Then his servant brought her out and bolted the door after her. And Tamar put ashes on her head and rent her garment of diverse colors that was on her and laid her hand on her head and went on crying. So without much surprise, Tamar is distraught and despondent. She's been defiled by her own brother and she 
tears her garments because those particular garments are only supposed to be worn by a virgin. She is no longer a virgin. Neither does she have a husband. And she believes it unlikely that she will ever have a husband. And so she begins to weep, having no hope for an honorable future, much less a happy one. Now, many of you know that the story does not end here. It's at this point that the principal character of this section of our study, the one that's brought us to this sad affair in the first place, will now enter the picture. And that is, of course, Tamar's brother, Absalom. And Lord willing, next week, we will see his response when he becomes aware of the disgrace that has befallen his only sister. So I would ask you to please remember to pray for all those on our prayer list. And until next time, Shalom.